going to read this morning from Revelation chapter 4, and Revelation is the last book in the Bible, and we're just going to read the whole chapter, and it's page 1236, if you've got a Bible on the way in. Reading from verse 1. This is John speaking, John who um, wrote Revelation, and he's speaking. He's, he's in Patmos, probably in prison there, and he has a vision. After this, I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and ruby. A rainbow that shone like an emerald encircled the throne. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones, and seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings, and peals of thunder. In front of the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God, or the sevenfold spirit of God. Also in front of the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. In the center, round the throne, were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes in front and behind. The first living creature was like a lion, the second was like an ox, the third had a face like a man, the fourth was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all round, even under its wings. Day and night they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy, our Lord and God. To receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. Amen. This weekend there has been a bit of a focus on on thrones and on a particular throne. And whether you are into the coronation or not, there has been no escape. And I thought this morning that we would continue the theme a little, but with a focus on a different kind of throne but also a focus on a scene far more impressive and dramatic than the scenes that were witnessed in London yesterday. For in our reading, we are welcomed not into some abbey for the coronation of a human king, but we are welcomed instead into into heaven itself and to the throne room of God. Nowadays, you can quite often see programs that take you behind the scenes of certain situations or events. 
So you can watch a series which goes behind the scenes at, at Manchester City, if you would want to do such a thing. Or you might be able to watch a program that takes you behind the scenes of a making of, of, of a movie or of Formula One or whatever it might be. And it's basically saying you've seen the film, you've seen the football team play, here's what happens behind it all. Here's the stuff you don't see. And in much of Revelation, that is what is happening. We are being allowed to see behind the scenes. We're allowed to see what is going on on the other side of the veil. And in this chapter, we have the privilege of traveling with John, sitting in a prison cell in Patmos, to the throne room of God Himself, to have a glimpse of what's going on behind the scenes. And in it, there is a lot of imagery and picture language. It's not meant to be taken literally. But John is trying to describe something that is, that is indescribable. And he's helping us to see it all in its glory and its wonder and majesty. And the emphasis is very much on the throne. The throne is at the center of the vision, and I think 14 times in the chapter, the word throne is used. And the emphasis is on the one who is on the throne, God himself. There's actually very little to describe the one on the throne. All it says is that he has the appearance of jasper and ruby, which were, which were precious, valuable stones, which would have been familiar to, to those who knew their Old Testament. But also, around the throne, you try to picture this, around the throne there is a, there's a rainbow, a rainbow that goes all the way around. And this rainbow shines like an emerald. Have you ever seen a circular rainbow? Have not. Have you ever seen a circular em rainbow that looks like an emerald? Can you even picture that? But that is what John is describing. And this rainbow, of course, that reminds us of the rainbow in Genesis that was to be a sign to Noah after the flood that God would never destroy the earth. It was a promise of His faithfulness. And so there's the throne with the one there who looks, has the appearance of jasper and ruby, precious stones. There's the rainbow. And then also, with the throne, there are, there, are, there are folks who are sitting around the throne. For there, there were 24 elders who each had their throne and each had their crowns. What's going on here? Well, some people think that the 24 comes from the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles. 12 and 12 makes 24. There's also other suggestions that one of them being that it points to the 24 divisions of the Levitical priesthood in the Old Testament, of which I'm sure you're all very familiar.
but they most likely, through these examples, represent the whole people of God. And they're dressed in white, a sign of purity, purity that is found in Jesus Christ. And so they're there. There's the rainbow, there's the jasper, there's, there's the throne. But then there's also the thunder and the lightning. From the throne there are flashes of lightning and thunder. Imagine yesterday if if you were watching it, as, as, as the crown was placed on Prince King Charles's head. Imagine if at that moment there were peals of thunder and flashes of lightning. Well, that is what is happening around the throne room of God. And it was the same that had been there in Exodus when the people of God, people of Israel on Mount Sinai had met with God. There there was, there was thunder. There was lightning. And also there is the seven spirits of God, or the sevenfold spirit of God, which represents, which is this Holy Spirit. As the lamps burn, it's a dramatic picture. There's a thunder, there's a lightning, there's the elders, there's the throne. Everybody's looking at the throne. And there's also what looks like a sea of glass, clear and crystal. And if you're trying to picture it, you've maybe managed so far, it's going to get harder in a minute. For, for there is more to come. For, for then, when we are introduced to, to living creatures, four living creatures, all of which had six wings, which were covered with eyes, one like a lion, one like an ox, the third had a face like a man, and then finally the fourth was like a flying eagle. And they most probably represent for us the whole creation of God. The lion is the king of the wild beasts. The ox is the leader of the tamed animals. The face, like a man, is presumably humanity. And the eagle is the king of the birds. So it's all creation. And they are covered in eyes everywhere. Which maybe points to the idea that they are unsleepingly keeping watch for God over his whole creation. And what are they doing? Well, they're worshipping God. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Day and night. They worship the one who is on the throne. They worship the God who is holy, which means that he's set apart, pure, righteous. The God who is almighty, the creator of all things, above all things. The God who is eternal, who was and is and is to come. The Alpha and the Omega, the, the begin, in the beginning was God.
And as the creatures worship, well, they're joined in by the people of God. Whenever the living creatures do this, it says, and worship the one who lives forever, then, then the elders, they, they too fall down before him. They take off their crowns. A sign of humility, a sign of service, and they say, you are worthy, our Lord and God. To receive glory, honor, power, for you created all things. The creatures worship, the people of God, the elders worship, and they expand on the worship. He deserves to be worshiped because he's holy, but also because all things were created by him. It's in you that we all have our being. It's a strange picture. It's a strange vision. But you get, I a, a, a hope, a sense of the, of the grandeur of it, the majesty of all that is happening, the, the holiness of all that is happening. It is hard to picture it all, but that's probably intentional because, because John's wanting us to know this is beyond what you can understand. This is beyond any coronation. This is beyond any earthly worship event. It's meant to be unimaginable because it's too amazing. It's too awesome. And if you read into chapter 5, then you'll find, you'll find that this continues. For in chapter 5, we're then introduced to, to the Lamb who was slain. The Jesus Christ who was anointed, as Jack was sharing with us earlier on, who was the anointed one and who was the one who died that we might live. And as the people around the throne see the Lamb, again there is worship to Him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. What are we to take away from all of this? What are the practical implications of this chapter for our lives today? There's a couple of things. It's a reminder, isn't it, that there is one who is enthroned above all and over all. The first listeners to the book of Revelation, who it was directly written to, were Christians who were going through difficult times. They were part of the early church, and they were Christians in the Roman Empire. And many of them were in churches that were weak and struggling, and they were also Almost all of them were facing suffering and persecution. And under their, the rule of the day, there were emperors who would call on the people to honor them as if they were gods. And these emperors would, well, they had their own throne rooms. And they were the ones who were to receive glory and honor and power. In these days, you weren't just encouraged to, to pledge allegiance to the king, 
Well, you had to pledge allegiance to to Caesar, but more than that, you had to declare that he was Lord. Worthy are you, our Lord, and God, the people would say, not not to God, the living God on his throne, but instead to Caesar or to the emperor of the day. And it's these folks that the John is writing to specifically. And here is this vision for them, this vision of John, which picks up on, on some of the elements of this kind of Roman rule and puts it in perspective. And he's saying to the people, yeah, you've got these Roman rulers, but remember, remember the one who is on the throne above all. Here is the ultimate throne room. The throne room of the one who created all things. The one who is holy, who is worthy, who is the creator. There may be other throne rooms. There may be some who demand to be worshipped as God. But there is only one God who is holy and who is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And so John is speaking to these young, suffering Christians and assuring them, God is on the throne. And he is the one you can worship. He is the one you can follow in the good times, but also the bad. And that is the same for us today. Leaders come and leaders go. Kings and queens come and go. But there is a throne room in heaven. And there is a God on the throne. A creator God. A holy God. A God who is worthy to receive glory and honor and power. And he will remain. And we can know that when life is chaotic, when life is uncertain, when life is not plain sailing. We might wonder, what is going on in my life? What is going on in our world? What is going on in my family? And we need to be reminded God is still on the throne. And he has a plan for good, a plan for blessing. And the rest of Revelation is what that is all about. And maybe that is what you need to be assured of today. That in the uncertainty of your life, of our lives, in the anxiety perhaps, that there is a God who is still on the throne and he has a plan. But secondly, the other practical implication for us is is that there is a call, isn't there, to worship. The Westminster Catechism, which I'm sure, again, you're all very familiar with, asks the question, what is man and woman's primary purpose? 
And the answer is the primary purpose of man and woman is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. It is to worship, to glorify Him, to do so in our words and in our lives, to worship the one who deserves our worship. The, the whole of creation is to give glory and praise to our God, who is, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who is Holy Creator, Almighty, who gives of Himself in Christ Jesus, the Lamb who was slain. And that is what we do together as we gather each Sunday morning. We gather to worship the one who is holy. And that's an important thing that we do. It's why we do it regularly. It's why we set apart time. Because God is worthy of our worship as a church family. But it's not just to be something that we do for an hour and a bit on a Sunday morning. It's something that is to be part of our lives in the midst of all that is going on in our lives, to make space, to take time, to focus on the one who is on the throne and to worship him. Is that part of our day-to-day lives? Is it part of our, of our day-to-day living and when we take time to focus on the one who is on the throne and to give him praise. Many people take the Psalms and they perhaps read a Psalm each day and the Psalms very often are are Psalms of praise. And they say them as part of their worship. Others, perhaps, they use, we use worship songs to either sing along or to simply use to reflect on day by day. It's an opportunity to, to refocus our lives on the one who is on the throne. But maybe... Maybe we just need to take the words that are spoken here in these verses and make them our own each day. Each day at the beginning of our day to say, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. You're worthy to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things. Each day at the end of our day to say to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. One of the psalmists, Psalms, says these words, Be still and know that I am God. And there's an encouragement here, isn't there, to be still in our lives. To focus on Him, the one who is on the throne and the Lamb who was slain for us and to worship Him so that our words, so that our lives 
would be words and lives of worship. We sometimes sing these words, He is exalted, the King is exalted on high. I will praise Him. He is exalted, forever exalted, and I will praise His name. He is the Lord. Forever His truth shall reign. Heaven and earth, rejoice in His holy name. He is exalted. The King is exalted on high. Let's pray together. Father God, we take time to come into your presence, into your throne room, and to bow, bow before you and to worship you. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power. Forever and ever. We give thanks that you are on the throne in all the turmoil of our lives. Make us a people of worship and of praise to you forever and ever. Amen. Good man.